So let's move on to Soyman time, shall we? Uh, we're going to arrive today at the last of Jesus' judgment sermons and pa- judgment parable. Uh, the arc of this teaching uh, begins actually back in chapter 28 where Jesus calls out religious leaders, the religious folks of the day, uh, for their fastidious fascination with the unimp- unimportant. And then, in what could be con- considered a bank shot, He calls the disciples toward what God finds important. And what that is, is religion, uh, he, 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 he wants to speak against anything that is religion that is lodged in anything other than God. Religion lodged in anything other than God. So in context, uh, religion that is illustrated by the temple, which fell a scant 37 years later after Jesus was preaching on this in 70 A.D. <clears throat> Think about that, uh, that, that, that decade, by the way, because in 70 A.D., the destruction of the temple, st- destruction of Ju- Jerusalem, and in 79 A.D., Vesuvius blows up and destroys Pompeii and Herculaneum. That, what, what those people were dealing with at that particular time. So you'll notice as, you, as we go back over that, as we look over that, you'll notice that, that Jesus did not say that the temple is unimportant. Jesus did not say that religion is unimportant. Jesus did not say that what we, what we build is unimportant. He did not throw out law. He did not throw out religion. What He said was, don't stop there. We know this because as he preaches and he goes on within these two chapters, he begins to talk about things like persecution. We are going to be persecuted and what that looks like. He talks about the necessity of watchfulness. Back a few minutes ago, I talked in the song Joy in the Journey, the fact that we all who seek Him shall find Him, that we, we need to listen to the the, the disciplines of the church that we preached on a couple of years ago. We need to go back and re-watch those sermons and reacquaint ourselves with that. that. That's why watchfulness is so important. He went on, as Adam talked about last week, that, that, that what we do with our stuff, what we build, well, what we do with our money, what we do with our talents, with our resources, is important. And as Jesus asked, do we use them or do we bury them? These are important questions. And then today, as we, as we approach the text in Matthew chapter 25, uh, <clears throat> beginning at, uh, at, at verse, where is it? It's over here somewhere. Uh, verse 31, um, he asks some simple final questions in these parables of judgment. He says, first of all, do we use those talents, do we use those resources for what God is for? Secondly, he asks, are we for those whom Jesus is for. And then finally, he says, do we welcome those who Jesus welcomes? The welcomers, Jesus calls sheep. The non-welcomers, Jesus calls goats. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. Because a goat ain't got no hope. Nope. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. I just want to be a sheep. I just want to be a sheep. From my head down to my feet. Yeah. I just want to be a sheep. (laughs) Camp songs. This, this, Carol and I spent way too much time in camping ministry. I apologize. Now, of course, sheep or goats, they, 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 neither of these have any intrinsic blessing or curse because they're, they're sheep. They're, they're goats. They're animals. What they are here, Jesus using them as placeholders for the first century agrarian culture to teach us something. The point is not which cloven-footed animal we are. The point is, are we Jesus' people? The point is, are we with Him? And what does being with Him look like? The thing is, for most of my life, when I've preached this text, or I've heard others preach this text, I have heard proclaimed, or at least heard a distinct lack 
lack of honesty. Because when we, Christ Church, read this, we always see ourselves or we always present ourselves as sheep and never goats. But as I read this, I want you to give an honest assessment of Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. Because guys, guys, I think just maybe we might be goats. Listen to this. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all of His angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. And all of the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So just kind of get that into your head. It's the end of time. All of the nations are gathered together. And Jesus does not say that only the Jews are the sheep and all the other people are the goats. He doesn't make that distinction. He brings all the nations together before him, And from all of those nations separates the sheep from the goats. And then it begins, it goes on from there. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, that's the sheep, that, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Listen to this. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And then he will say to those at his left hand, these would be the goats, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not give me clothing sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do to one of these least of mine, you did not do it to me. And these will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The word of the Lord? (laughs) Tough. Tough. Tough texts, guys. Tough texts. So, what we are reading here is that Jesus is all about radical relationship with all of us. All of the nations came to prayer. All of the ethnos, it says. Ho, ho ethnos. All of the ethnic people came to be a part of a relationship with Him. So the question is, How do we participate in that? How do we reciprocate within that? How do we radically identify with Jesus and all those whom Jesus loves, all that Jesus loves? And the context of the parable, how are we sheep and not goats? Well, as I just read, Matthew 25 answers with a deceptively simple diagnostic. We do all that through generous, loving service. Okay, we, we know what that word means. We, I mean, we think we do. We remember back when we went to restaurants, we would ask for service from a waiter or a waitress, a server. We, we think we understand what those things mean, but do we really? The word service in the New Testament is the word diakonia. It's where we get the word today, deacon. And what it means is somebody who serves with sympathy, witness, and service. It's a rich, rich word. And and, and it's a rich concept in the Bible. The word conveys the idea of urgent ministry, urgent doing, urgent relationships. Diakonia comes from a compound Greek word built through two words that are placed together. Dia, which means through, and, and kiona, which means dust. And and so what it does is it paints this word picture of you are so important to me 
that as I strive to serve you, I will kick up dust like the roadrunner. You know, we, we, we are going to go so fast, we're going we're gonna to move so much that we want to help you. It's so important to us. We want to be diaconias, servants. So urgent service is a diagnostic for knowing Jesus. Okay? But who do we serve? No. Remember verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on the throne of His glory and all the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate people from one from another as a shepherd, shepherd separates sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep at His right hand and the goats at His left. And then the King will say, Come all, that you, are, come all you that are blessed. So end of the world as we know it, as we talked about a few weeks ago, uh, the, Jesus says that the, that the, the Son of Man... Who's, who's him, uh, will gather all these ethnic peoples together. He will separate the sheep from the goats, and he will say to those at his, the sheep at his right hand, come to me, all you who are blessed. And the, the grammar here basically means, come you who have been being blessed. And what that means is, is it means that we have been on being blessed in an ongoing way. It is a present reality. We have been and we are being blessed. Blessed for what? Or blessed into what? We are blessed into a holy new kingdom of God. What does that look like? The Apostle Luke wrote about it. God bless that person as they head to St. Joe's. The Apostle Luke, Luke talked about it in Acts chapter 2, verse 43 when he said, here is what that looks like. Here's what it looked like for the church. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. And and listen to it. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they spent so much time together in the temple that they broke bread in their home. They ate their food with glad and generous hearts. They praised God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. That is what the kingdom looks like. That is what the community of Christ gathered together, the kingdom looks like. It looks like a whole new way of living. A whole new way of living that is is not predicated on how much we make, or how big our house is. I suppose the more how, bigger your house is, the more people you could have in to share a common meal. But, but it, it is that idea of experiencing a holy new heaven, a holy new earth, a redeemed earth, and an, a new heaven. As I said previously, in the end, the earth is not quick fried to a crackly crunch. The earth is redeemed. It is renewed. And as we dis- discussed a few weeks ago, when we first entered into encountered Jesus' first parable of judgment, this renewal is not going to take place at the end when the the Son of Man gathers all together all the ethnic people as sheep and goats. This renewal is happening right now. We are right now being blessed. That's the context of what Jesus says to the sheep at that point. Those who are being blessed, we are blessed at this moment, and we are held because we are being blessed, because we are receiving His blessings, we are being held accountable to be a blessing. You and I are right now living in the end times. We are now, right now, living in this world of improv where we have studied this book so much that we have, we've, we've acquainted ourselves so well with our faith grandparents and, and what they did right and what they did wrong, and we have listened to the Holy Spirit move within our lives through prayer and study and through worship. Now we are prepared, and we go out, and we do what God has calling us to do. We get to be a blessing to others. But wait, you say. The kingdom looks like a year-long pandemic and political upheaval? Exactly. It's exactly what it looks like. Yes, these are troubled times. But how are we to be a blessing to others if we're not serving in troubled times? Stop and think about it. 
How are we not to be a blessing to others if there's no need for us to be a blessing? Oh, sure, we could be goats. We could look at a year-long pandemic and become cranky. We could uh, be depressed. We could collect up toilet paper. We could hide behind our security systems and not wear masks, not get the vaccine when it's our turn. We could take political pot shots at one another on social media and amass more and more and more of everything. Or we could be sheep, caring for those whom Jesus cares. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I realize that I am not the sharpest tool in the box. Uh, there's... There's, there's not going to be any argument here about, about that with most people. I, I, I understand that I'm not, and, and I'm, just, I'm just broaching something here. I'm moving out of my who I am and, and, and just asking you a question. In 2018, the U.S. Govern, government made a $2.3 trillion tax cut that primarily benefited those who made over $1 million a year. Okay? And then just last week... They passed a $1 trillion dollar stimulus plan that, among other things, provides people who are out of work due to the pandemic their rent, gives businesses a hand, and provides parents who make under a certain dollar amount $300 a month per child. I ask you, between those two things, which is a sheep move and which is a goat move? I, 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 I don't know. I'm not smart enough to figure this stuff out. But what I do know is that it sounds more like a sheep than a, uh, 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 the latter sounds more like a sheep than a goat move because listen to verse 35. These are not my words. These are Jesus' words. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was, a naked, I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. The kingdom appears to be a place where we get to meet the needs of those people who have needs. The kingdom appears to be a place where we get to serve the people whom Jesus loves in their need. Now, of course, in order to share, the sheep need resources. We need generosity. We need the generous people of God. We need Bill Gates, right? Bill Gates has done an amazing thing, and I know somebody's going to come back and say, yeah, but he's done this. Yeah, but he's done some really good stuff. Or Warren Buffett. Some of those people who have just thrown caution to the wind, perhaps, but have done amazing things. We need the generous people of West Press. My gosh, you guys have been generous through this time. We, have, we are so grateful for that, and we, we know that that's because God has moved in your heart to be generous. We need people who realize that if we hold on to all this money, that we're going to start to look impolite. But come on, people. Why is Jesus asking, or is, I'm sorry, is what Jesus is really asking all that hard? I mean, while I understand that His list, it, it's not necessarily an exhaustive list, it is a beginning point. Look how basic it is. Feed the hungry. Give the thirsty a drink, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, care for the sick, visit those in prison. Is that really that hard? The, um, the Second Vatican Council, uh, no, sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. The fourth century bishop, rather, John, John Chrysostom said this, he says, Jesus doesn't say I was sick and you healed me. Jesus doesn't say I was in prison and you liberated me. We're not, we're not doctors. We're not re revolutionaries. No, he says, Jesus' ministry is simple. He isn't calling us to perform big miracles, just little ministries, which evidence his kingdom. Food, drink, clothes, and, and, and read that as resources, these are basic hierarchy needs, which any of us can give in, in time of need. We don't have to be trained as a doctor. We don't have to be trained as a social worker. We don't even have to be trained as a pastor. We just have to love Jesus. Visiting hurting people, especially if they're not productive or attractive or strategic for us, or if they're different from us, 
especially when they're socially shamed or peripheral, is the 21st century continuation of what Jesus did in the first. And welcoming the stranger, well, that's how it all gets started, isn't it? It's easy for us to welcome those people who look like us or act like us or in the same socioeconomic situation as us. But that doesn't challenge us. That doesn't make us different. After all, we can't feed or clothe or, or, or do anything to some, for somebody without first meeting them, without first welcoming them. One translation I read of this text says, you brought me into your family circle. You took me into your family. The Second Vatican Council, now I get to that, says this, whenever there are people in need of food and drink, clothing and housing, medicine, employment and education, wherever people lack the facilities necessary for living a truly human life or are tormented by hardships or poor health or suffer exile or imprisonment, there... Christian charity should seek to seek them out and find them, console them with eager care, and relieve them with this gift of help. This obligation is imposed upon every prosperous person and nation. The response, then, to this sheep and goats idea of the assembled people reflects the response of people who get Jesus at a sheep level. In verse 37, they answer him, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry or gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and gave you, gave you clothing? When, when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and we visited you? And what does the king answer? And listen to this. This is really, really important. Verse 40, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. That is how much Jesus identifies with us. When we're doing it for them, we're doing it for Him. This generous service to others, to the stranger, to the hungry, to the thirsty, to the naked, to those imprisoned, is what we do when we are with Jesus, because Jesus is with them. And folks, I don't care what game I'm playing. I want Jesus on my team. I want to be playing by His rules. I want to be doing the things that He calls me to. And He has given all of this, not just to those people, He has given it to us. Stop and think about it. We are recipients of Jesus' food and drink. We are welcomed and we are sheltered. We are healed of our hurt, which isn't ignored. Our hurt isn't ignored, guys. It's embraced. It is, it is visited. It is sat with. And in Jesus Christ, it is absorbed into Him and into the cross. We have to ask, how in the world did we, Christ's church, fall so far from the simple illustration of a shared heart for those in need. How? How, how, did, how? how did we forget that this is precisely that what Jesus did for us? Guys, I think we may be goats. And we have to take a hard look at that. Because the, the, the text concludes with a hard truth of being a goat, of not doing what Jesus does, with these gut-wrenching words. Verse 45, truly I tell you, just as you did not do to one of the least of these of me, of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Why would we want to be goats? Why would we, why would we not give, give drink to the thirsty? Because... They might use it to buy alcohol? Okay, I guess. Okay, then, then why not feed the hungry? Because they might hang around? Because they might become a bother or dependent? Okay. So why would we not give resources to those who need them? 
Well, as with the hungry and the thirsty, because they might use it for something that we don't feel is appropriate, or they might hang around more, or it might be the same rationale for, for not welcoming the stranger, or not, not visiting those in prison, because we will create a relationship that might take us in a direction we don't want to go. And we have to confront that. Bottom line, my fellow goats, Jesus calls us to minister to those to whom we might not wish to visit. In the context of the parable, the thirsty, the hungry, the naked, the lonely, the prisoner, the other. And so this is a dangerous text. It is a text that most of us want to rip out of our Bible. But we have to come to the fore of understanding that this is exactly what Jesus has done for us. If we're goats within the kingdom, it creates an awful separation, a great divorce from Jesus and those He cares about. Of course it does. Because He really does care for everyone. He really does. And the less we care for those for, of whom, for whom He cares, the further we are for him, from Him. But hear this, my fellow goats. We are saved by grace, not by works. How do we know this? Well, what did Jesus do immediately following his, this disquieting parable? What is the whole rest of the book about? He died for us. That's what the rest of the book is about. Jesus condemns good church folk of Jerusalem for not loving the other. And then He dies for them anyway. He went to the cross for the sheep and the goats. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, challenge us, He said with a catch in His throat. Challenge us to understand what Your call upon our lives is, and not just the call that 20th century or 21st century Western culture has placed upon us. Let us look deeply into what You call us to, and let us not take just the word of this poor preacher, but let us take the word of Your Son, Jesus Christ, who said, just as You did for the least of these, You did for me. And let us not equivocate. In your name we pray. Amen.